Good morning, everybody. How many of you are, have in your day job a responsibility for cybersecurity, or just security, or just cyber? <laughs> okay, <laughs> any of those, any of those. So maybe cyber? You never know, you never know. Is, oh, this is open source. Uh, and how many of you don't have any security responsibility in your daily work? All the rest should now raise their hands. <laughs> Something is wrong here. Something is amiss. I have a simple point today, so I could stop after the title slide. Security is everybody's responsibility. And if you do security today, you must stop being so inwards focused and open up and bring others into security. And if you are not doing security today, you need to start doing it. Because you are not in software if you are not in security. If you go and visit somebody in a hospital, who is in charge for fighting contamination? You. You wash your hands, you disinfect your hands, everybody does it. You may not own the hospital, you're not the doctor, you're not the nurse, you're not the patient, but you are in charge of the security of the hospital, meaning keeping viruses away and bacteria. And and many of us here, we have happily been developing open source and other pieces of software for decades, and we're so proud of the millions of installations we have. But I, I invite you to do like I do, and repent and fix this thing. Because what we built for fun is now used for the most critical parts of society. And we can't just keep doing it the way we did. We have to build security into all the fun stuff that we kept building over the past several decades. So yes, yeah, so that's, that's me um, on the left. Uh, I'm CEO of HackerOne. We, we try to bring open source philosophies into the area of security. We call ourselves a hacker-powered security company. We have 160,000 contributors, security researchers, ethical hackers, white hats who have signed up to find flaws in your software, to find vulnerabilities. That's software bugs, but it's more than software bugs. So, uh, security vulnerabilities can emanate from situations without any bug. But when there's a security uh, vulnerability in a system, we will find it. We hacked the Air Force. It took us eight minutes to break in. We found 200 vulnerabilities in the Air Force's systems. 20 of those were found by Jack Cable, a 17-year-old high school student from Chicago, Illinois. These are the hackers that work with us and for us as volunteers and freelancers to, to find the vulnerabilities. But we need you to fix them. Somebody also must fix the, the code there. So in, in the history of, of the HackerOne company, our customers have, we have found and our customers have fixed over 65,000 security vulnerabilities to date. So that has removed a lot of holes where criminals could have entered hasn't removed all the holes. There are, I don't even know how many, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, a billion. Who knows how many vulnerabilities there are in the joint attack surface of the world. But if we deploy 100 billion lines of code every year, new lines of code, there's a lot of security to look after. Uh, we operate a nonprofit that supports open source projects who can't afford this themselves. It's called the Internet Bug Bounty, so feel free to check it out. And we publish vulnerability reports for the whole world. So go to Hacktivity and read the reports and learn uh, in what ways software can, be, can have uh, security vulnerabilities. Cybersecurity or security or whatever you call it, if you don't know it, you just call it cyber. It's a $100 billion market today. $100 billion is spent on cybersecurity. And in this business, we call it, or some of us say, cybersecurity is the new marketing. Half of the money is wasted. We just don't know which half. <laughs> We've been buying hardware and software and machines and walls and all kinds of stuff, thinking that, that technology and products will make us secure. But that's not true. It isn't security. It doesn't make you any more secure if you buy more hardware. If you pile up hardware around your company and you have a perimeter. It doesn't make you more secure. But yet the world is spending 100 billion a year trying to get more secure by 
by doing all these things? The, the answer is, is much more simple and much more boring and unpleasant because this is security. Security is when you share. You share the defense, you share information, you work together. You can't be secure if just some are secure and others are not. You can't have secure software if just some of your software engineers are in charge of security. You can't just delegate it or relegate it to a security team. If you do that, it won't happen. It's the same as in the 90s when everybody had a quality manager or quality VP of quality or something and everybody got their ISO certifications. It didn't help. It reduced quality in the companies because people felt that quality now was the job of somebody else, not of you. Some things are so important that you cannot give them to just one team or one group. And security is a discipline. It's doing it every single time. If you go and visit your friend in the hospital, you better wash your hands and disinfect them every single time you go in and when you come out. And it's not about how many times you did it. It's making sure that you never fail to do it. So that's hard for all of us who are a little bit sloppy and we would like to be secure, but we don't always pay attention to it. Unfortunately, software security only happens when we're very uh, disciplined. And I'll go into more details about this. Specifically, when we say shared, we often talk about cyber threats being asymmetric in the sense that one single criminal attacker, one single malicious attacker can cause a lot of harm. So much harm that you need 100 people to defend. And it's nearly always like this in crime. One bad guy will need 100 good guys to stop that bad guy. And then we say, oh, it's an asymmetric threat and there's nothing we can do because they're, they don't need as many people as we do. But there is a cure to this, and that's pooled defense. Because the number of defenders is far larger than the number of bad guys. There are far more white hats in the world than there are black hats. And when I said we have 160,000 hackers signed up at HackOne, we already have more people signed up with our service than there are black hats in the world. So if companies can get together and pool the defense, you turn the asymmetry around, and suddenly you have 10 times the power of the attackers. Still, the, every single attack is an asymmetric threat to you. But if you share information, share the defense, share best practices, and share the, the act of, of responding to threats, then you overcome the asymmetry and you turn it around. And the discipline and diligence. It, unfortunately, uh, the devil is in the detail. Everybody talks about uh, Equifax, and it's a very sad story, and we could probably note that that company has so many failures and, and acts of negligence or sort of omissions uh, in their, the way they handle security, and all of this bad stuff happened, and it's just getting worse. But think about it. It was one single software vulnerability that led to the data breach in their systems. One single vulnerability. There's nobody here who has a software system with just one vulnerability. All of you have a system with many, just your smartphone or your laptop or your company systems. So this shows that you have to be very diligent and have the commitment to take care of every single vulnerability because you never know where they might attack. Of course, you start with the most severe ones and then you end by, by fixing the easy ones. That's how you keep the risk down. But, but there's no way around this. So many times in cybersecurity we complain about long passwords or we complain about multi-factor authentication and this is taking too much time. Guys, get used to it. It doesn't, security doesn't come for free. The only thing that goes, acts against these threats is the discipline and diligence. Remembering long passwords or whatever it is. Even when somebody invents a method where we don't mean passwords anymore, you will be asked to do something else which is burdensome and everyday and where you are not allowed to miss it one single time. Just like seat belts. We wear seat belts all the time and it takes just one act of not wearing a seat belt and it's bad. It's the same here and we just have haven't agreed or we have refused to acknowledge that it's the same with, with cybersecurity. And then we have to be so fast. Because whatever happens, the bad guys are fast. So you have to be a little bit faster. And Jim talked about how can we make this cycle spin faster. 
One of the big, big problems of software today is that the update cycle is too slow. We had a severe vulnerability reported through our service to an online service that's very, very popular among all of you. Uh, it was reported on Friday afternoon, and they fixed it in six hours. So they received a message saying, here's something, I think this is severe. They read it within 30 minutes and said, yes, this is very severe, let's start working on it. They figured out how to fix it in the next few hours. They tested it, they rolled out the patch, everything done within six hours. And the faster you can act, the lower your risk for any incidents. And it's all about acting fast. And jokingly, you don't have to be fast, you just have to be faster than your competitors. Because criminals are lazy and they go for the low hanging fruit, they go for the companies that have the weakest defense. So if you're known to have a strong defense, then they're less likely to try. Of course, they will still try, but they're a little bit less likely. So acting without delay and acting right without delay. Of course, if a security incident truly happens, then rule number one is don't freak out. Don't freak out. We just did a red team exercise inside our company where a few people staged a very bad attack on Hacker One, and we had so many people freaking out. Uh, so uh, finally they say, okay, we must call our external counsel and report this because this has to be reported to the authorities. And at that point, um, we called the exercise off and said it, it was just an, a red team exercise this time, but it's good to do it. I didn't know about it. I was, I was not aware that we were doing it, but, but it's a very good way of testing whether you freak out or not when, when things really go bad. So response efficiency is key and also being knowing what to do. So when you plan for cybersecurity, you need to plan for what happens when something happens. So first is you do all the preventative work. That's a lot of work. Then you plan for the moment when an incident really occurs. So you need to have that plan ready. And then thirdly, you need to have a plan ready for what you do afterwards. How do you clean up afterwards? So a lot of work to do after an incident has happened as well. And it needs to be, security needs to be embedded in everything we do. It just has to. Airline, security, airline safety is now like that. Airlines are probably the safest way of transportation, safer than walking in San Francisco. And it is because they've embedded it in everything they do. You cannot build an airplane or an engine or a wheel or anything, a bolt for a screw, any small little piece for an airplane without having it tested and approved. And everybody who works there will think about safety every day. They share everything with competitors and they've embedded safety in everything airlines and airports and aircraft do, and that's why it is so safe. We just haven't done it in software yet. This is a juvenile industry compared to, to the airline industry. But then there was a time when flying was very dangerous. It is not anymore. So if there was a time when software was very dangerous like now, there will come a time when it's not dangerous anymore. We will figure this out, but it will require embedding it in everything we do. So in summary, <clears throat> here are things we must do. You are, many of you are already doing it, so I'm partly preaching to the choir here. But we must democratize security. We must make cybersecurity a topic for everybody. A small topic for everybody, not a big one. There will be experts who will need CISOs and security architects and all these people. They are not going away. But they must be inclusive in what they do. They must bring in everybody into that work. And everybody must feel a responsibility for it. Just like we feel responsibility for uh, hygiene when we go to a hospital or we accept the security checkpoints at the airport. All of these things that we do every day without thinking. We use seat belts in cars. We do many things now that originally felt cumbersome and clunky and difficult. And now we say, yeah, it's a cost of living. It's a cost of being a human being. So we must democratize it. Number two, those who are not in open source need to learn from open source. Open source has built an amazing functionality for people to work together, and specifically for people who disagree to work together. That's perhaps the best accomplishment of open source ever. I have never found two open source people who would agree on anything. <laughs> Yet it works. 
So you build a governance of how to resolve conflict, how to vote, how to decide which feature to do, whether it's quality or shipment time or what matters. And building this ability for conflict resolution is, is one of the great accomplishments of, of open source. And then with that goes the transparency. You can't do that if you're not transparent. You need to share. Uh, we need to legislate cyber hygiene. This is a message for Congress and parliaments in other countries. When it's a shared responsibility like this, it won't happen if our elected uh, legislators don't state so in a law. And we have no law today that would really mandate companies to take care of this. It's finally happening, I think. I don't know how fast those, those wheels rotate. They weren't on Jim's slide. It can take years. But it's important that we set a standard that nobody can avoid and nobody can, can uh, um, stay away from. And then with software. We need to f be able to fix software, and if software cannot be patched or fixed, then deprecate it. Stop living and working with software that isn't designed for this connected world. We have so much software that was designed before the internet, or that assumed that no, not everybody could connect it. Today, everything is connected. If the software can't handle it, if you can't roll out, roll out a patch when you find a security vulnerability, then deprecate the whole thing. We did that in Y2K. We took out all software that couldn't handle modern dates. We should do the same with, with security and software. Just take it out. It's expensive. It's painful. It's difficult. You will say it's impossible. Yeah, I have heard all of those. It's not true. It is possible. The world has to go on. And then, as, as a message to our educational institutions, don't call it computer science and software engineering unless there's security in it. Today, you can graduate in CS without taking a single course in security. You don't have to pay any attention to security. And I certainly didn't when I took my degree a long time ago. But now we must change that. It has to become part of everything we do. And when we do all of this, the ship will turn. It's a big ship, so it'll turn slowly. But it will turn, and we will get to a state that is similar to what we have with airline safety, or hospital hygiene, or car. Uh, automotive safety, where today it all works. But it works because we do it together and we jointly take responsibility for it. Thank you. So I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, obviously, that's one of the reasons you're here. Uh, but you know, one of the things that uh, is happening this week, and I want to encourage people, is I think you're so right in that there's not any single solution. It is a collective responsibility. I'll give you a couple of examples that are happening yeah. this week. Yeah. Uh, SPDX is uh, an initiative that we've been working on for a long time at the Linux Foundation in order to understand a software bill of materials. This was largely for license compliance. but. To your point, is if you don't know what software you're actually running, if you don't have an easy way for an upstream supplier to provide that to their downstream supply chain, how are you going to fix anything, right? You don't Very even true. know. Very true. So these are things. You see how these things start to interconnect to Martin's point, which if we all think of and take responsibility and create this culture of like, hey, I've got a different way of trying to solve that same problem, we're all going to have better outcomes. So I love the perspective. Thank you so much. For Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you.